here at Mission Health in uh, one of their, not hospital offices, but outer offices, and I'm with Dr. Duff Reardon, who's a neurologist. We're gonna, you need to see this, this episode. If you've tuned in and you're in the middle of this, you need to sit down and listen because I am sure this is gonna be information that you're gonna want to hear. Dr. Reardon is a neurologist, and we're gonna start right off with, what is a neurologist? You know, I get <laughs> asked that question all the time. We're, we're a consulting specialist. And if you come to the hospital, to the emergency room with um, neurological problems, usually my partners are going to see you for strokes or hemorrhages or seizures. But if you come to the neurologist in the office, really I like to think of myself as a medical detective. So I talk to people about their problems with pain, spells, numbness and weakness. And there are some neurologic diseases that we treat commonly like epilepsy or seizures and Parkinson's disease and dementias. Okay, that's, that's the secret word for what we're going to talk about today is dementias. That is a scary word. It, it's a scary word as I, as I slide down the, the aging train here. Uh, when I was young, didn't think about it. If we've got viewers in their 30s, maybe even 40s, they're not maybe thinking about it. Mm -hmm. As you slide into 50 and 60, it becomes more of a scary, scary word. So define dementia. Well, you're right. We're, we're, we're in the baby boom generation, you and I probably both, and about five years ago, the first baby boomers turned 65, and 65 is really the, the magic number when we start worrying about dementia. You know, one of the things that I get asked all the time is, is dementia different from Alzheimer's? Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Well, I would look at dementia as being a, a broad category that, lit, that covers several different diseases where you lose cognitive skills. Now, usually we think about that as losing your short-term memory, right. but it's not just memory. It, it sadly is impairments of judgment, trouble producing speech, understanding speech, not being able to do calculations in your head, all those things sort of encompass dementias. Right. Now, so it's not just, I misplaced my keys. It's not. Or, it, it's more serious than that. So we think about dementia as being diagnosed when it's clinically significant. We all have some memory problems, mm -hmm. and a little <laughs> bit of memory difficulty is normal as we age, but if it becomes socially significant or professionally significant, mm -hmm. then it starts to reach the threshold of dementia. A lot of what I do is trying to help evaluate people who have these symptoms and try to come up with an explanation. And unfortunately, Alzheimer's is a very common explanation. So Alzheimer's and stroke dementia, that's, that's called vascular dementia now. It used to be called multi-infarct dementia. Those are probably the two most common. So you said some of this can be a part of a stroke. It can come on and be brought on by stroke. And I think people would understand if I've got that, people are going to be watching what I'm doing, and if they see a problem, they're going to catch it. And if it's a stroke problem, many times the symptoms are going to be sudden. So that's one of the clues right. that it's a, a stroke-related memory problem, is that there'll be sudden onset of weakness or numbness or vision loss and right. afterwards memory problems. But Alzheimer's is going to be slow. And it's probably fair to say that if you come to the doctor concerned about your memory, and I agree that you have memory problems, but they're not too bad. About 15% of those patients each year will progress to dementia. Okay, so y'all work to diagnose. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, do you ever find that, no, that's just a normal aging issue? Well, that's part of what we try to do. So <clears throat> we want to make sure that we exclude things that are, have a better prognosis. Right. So an example of a disease with a better prognosis would be depression. Depression is very common. If somebody has unrecognized depression and it's not treated, that's treatable, and that might significantly improve thinking problems. Yeah. Statistically, probably half the people with dementia mm -hmm. have not been told they have dementia. They may suspect they have a problem, but they've not sought any medical attention, and so that's millions of people. So if we end up diagnosing a patient with Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. One of the problems, usually, is memory difficulty. There are a few medicines that are available 
that help with memory modestly. That's not the only problem. Mm -hmm. So there are behavioral problems. There's depression that's associated with memory loss. Mm -hmm. Sleep problems. Sometimes, unfortunately, there are behavioral symptoms, right. being paranoid, suspicious. And these are all things that we can try treating. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's going to be treating with medications. Sometimes that's going to be working with a therapist. Right. But, but you can help them yes. deal with it. So if someone is diagnosed with, with Alzheimer's, does it, does it attack, and that's what it feels like to me, an attack, people at the same rate, like two people who are 50 and they both come down with it, or 60, are they going to progress kind of the same, or does it treat everybody different? It treats people differently, but probably typical course with Alzheimer's is four to eight years from diagnosis to death in most patients, but you can survive for 20 years or more with Alzheimer's. If you have a genetic Alzheimer's, they tend to affect you at a younger age. Okay. So, but it, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in this country. Is it really? Mm -hmm. For men and women? For men and women. And it probably really is higher than that because that's determined by what's put on the death certificate. But most people with Alzheimer's would die of infections like pneumonia right. or complications from a fall or injury. But if they don't put Alzheimer's on the death certificate, it's not attributed to Alzheimer's. Okay. So does Alzheimer's affect your brain, obviously, but does it affect other parts of your body? It primarily affects the brain. Right. Okay. And this, I think, is, is something, this is something I want to know. How prevalent is it? Well, you've used a good word. So when we think about things with statistics, we, we think about words like prevalence and incidence. Yeah. And so you think about prevalence as being the, the number of people with a disease in a population at any given time. So right. for example, there are probably 320 million people that live in the United States. And it's reasonable to say that half of them are women. Mm -hmm. So a prevalence figure might be 50% of everybody in the U.S. is a woman, mm -hmm. or 160 million. Now, if you think about Alzheimer's, the prevalence in the United States is 5,200,000. And like I said, most of those people don't know that they have it. They haven't been to, to see the doctor. They haven't been officially diagnosed, but more than 5 million. Now, most of those are going to be patients over 65, uh, but, okay. but 200,000 of that 5.2 million mm -hmm. are people under age 65. Really? So it hits younger <clears throat> people than 65? You know, the first patient that was diagnosed officially with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. was diagnosed by Dr. Alzheimer. He was a German neurologist, and this was back in the early 1900s, mm -hmm. and they were 56 years old. Now, people didn't live as long That's true. 100 years ago. And the reason why this is an Alzheimer's epidemic is that we're living longer. And the longer we live, Makes the sense. greater the percentage. Another way to sort of think about these numbers is if you're 65 years old, your chance of having Alzheimer's at that age in the population is about 2%. It increases incrementally as you get older. So every five years, mm -hmm. it doubles. So if you look at the population who's 70, mm -hmm. 4%. 75, 8%. 8%. All the way up to about 85. Yeah. And at 85, about 32% of the population will have Alzheimer's. Two thirds of them are women. Oh, great. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, a good a, it's a good news, bad news. It, the, the reason there are more women with Alzheimer's is that they live longer. Live longer. Yeah, that's the truth. And the longer you live, the, bigger the more your likely you are to have Alzheimer's. Now, if you make it to 65, mm -hmm. and you're a woman, and you don't have Alzheimer's, <laughs> your risk is about 20% through the rest of your life that you might develop Alzheimer's. In a man, it's a little bit less because we don't live as long. <laughs> It's about 17% yeah. that, that will get Alzheimer's. It's just a gamble. So the next question is, is mm -hmm. there any test you can do to tell me if I'm predisposed to have it? What happens with Alzheimer's is that you get changes in your brain. And those changes, let's say, without being too complicated, they destroy brain cells. Right. When the brain cells are destroyed, our treatment options are going to be very limited. 
we've got the medicines that help some with memory, but they don't restore function. If we could identify people earlier, yeah. then maybe there would be treatments that would stop that destruction. There are some tests that have value, but they're not ready for prime time yet. Oh, okay. Now, if, you, if your parents have had Alzheimer's, <laughs> is it hereditary? Is it up your percentage of... So it, that is a risk factor. Yeah. It is not exclusively a genetic disorder. So okay. probably gotcha. only 1% of Alzheimer families is it an autosomal dominant genetic disorder where every child has a 50-50 chance. But having a first degree relative, a sibling or a parent with Alzheimer's is a risk factor. Mm -hmm. So my risk would go up if I had that in my family. Right. But that's not the same thing as saying it's autosomal dominant. Gotcha. It usually takes several generations where you can go back two, three generations and find somebody who passed on that gene to say that it's genetic. Okay. So, since there's really not a test to know for sure, or no, and there's no medicine to give me to make sure that I never get any of this dementia or anything. What can I do for, for folks watching going, I never want any kind of dementia if I can help it. Well, some I things we can... live as long as possible. Well, what that, that, can I do? Living as long as possible <laughs> is, is a problem because getting older is the biggest risk factor. Right. We can't control that. Yeah. We can't control who in our family might right. have these problems, but there are some things that I think are very important. Yeah. So if the brain is being injured with a disease like Alzheimer's, we want to avoid any other injuries to the brain. And so that goes back to heart health. Mm -hmm. You want to have a heart healthy diet. You want to control your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and your cholesterol, because if you add blood vessel disease, you're going to get worse. Right. There are studies that show that if you remain physically active, you will do better. There are studies that show that if you have a high level of education, mm -hmm. you do better. And we think that maybe you have a little bit more reserve in your brain if you start to lose some tissue. Mm -hmm. Really, the best thing to know is if you think you're having issues, get to the doctor, get those mm -hmm. treatments early, but take care of yourself. That's right. Ahead of it all. In plan. So most people are not prepared. This is, you know, if we say, if, we lived, if we're lucky to live to 85 and we've got a, a third chance that we might have dementia, there's not enough people that can afford long-term mm -hmm. health insurance. If you're in difficult financial straits, the, the only payer that covers nursing home care would be Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of things that have to happen to be eligible for Medicaid right. when you get to that time. All, one of the hidden costs is the caregiver cost. Mm -hmm. So if the caregiver is your spouse or your child, they're not being paid for this. There are probably 15 million unpaid caregivers in this country providing care for patients with memory disorders. Mm -hmm. So that's just one of those, like you said, hidden mm -hmm. costs and requirements for this. And this is really, it's a growing, I guess, with the baby boomers. And like you mm -hmm. said, with our living longer, it is, it is one of those things that's on the horizon, not to get any better. Well, I think there is hope. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, if research is successful in getting that preclinical Alzheimer patient diagnosed with right. an effective treatment, that's going to be the key. Okay. So I'm very hopeful that we'll be having effective treatments. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. It's been very interesting. Uh, I would say informative. And as we age, we just need to be healthy, stay healthy, and hope we don't have to come see you anytime. I agree with that. <laughs>